We are born free. And we will die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. Welcome in. Welcome back to another episode of Finding Freedom right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. And really, really excited for today's episode. Have an outstanding guest. Um, if you've been listening to, following this show for a long period of time, then you will know my history digging into the Penn scandal, Jerry Sandusky scandal, whatever you want to call it, um, from having... Uh, investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker Ziegler on this show, I think five or six times uh, to highlight the work that he has done, completely um, ripping apart the uh, accepted narrative in this case. I've also had on Mark Pendergrast, who's who's written about this. I've had on um, John Snedden, who was the federal investigator, who you will hear my guest um, reference today, who investigated him, actually, and uh, found that he did nothing wrong. So you will notice during this case, when we're talking about this Penn State, this Jerry Sandusky scandal, I'm coming at it from the assumption that the listeners know that this case is bullshit, at least to a certain degree. Um, so if it comes off that way, I'm going to encourage you, and you don't know why, and you don't know about this case, I'm going to encourage you to go back and listen to some of those episodes. I'll link to them on the show notes page uh, for this podcast at lionsofliberty at lionsofliberty.com. And if you know for some reason um, you know you'd like to find some more information. And a lot of people, you know, once you get a taste of this and you just kind of have to dig all the way to the bottom and learn everything, the best place to go is to John Ziegler's podcast on this. It's called um, With the Benefit of Hindsight. It's fantastic. It's uh, John Ziegler and Liz Habib. Liz Habib, a, uh, a newscaster from Los Angeles. Now she's actually a professor at Syracuse University in the School of Journalism there, but they did a fantastic job going through every single detail of this case. And my guest today, the former president of Penn State, Graham Spanier, was interviewed on that podcast as well. So you can check that out. So without further delay, let's get into today's episode. All right, we are live. I'm joined by Graham Spanier. Graham served as the president of Penn State University from 1995 to 2011, as we were just talking about in the uh, the pre-show chat. That was that was during my time at uh, at Penn State. Um, he, had, he had prior positions um, at other universities, including at uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln, where he was provost and VP for academic affairs or sorry, where he was chancellor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a provost and, and vice president of academic affairs at Oregon State University. Oregon State, also a very nice campus. I've, I've been there as well. And also as vice provost for undergraduate studies at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, he actually s previously served at Penn State from 1973 to 1982 as a member of the faculty and in three administrative positions in the College of Health and Human Development. And he currently works as a consultant in national and international security, intelligence, and risk management. And the reason that Graham is, is really on the show today, we're going to talk mostly about his new book. It's called In the Lion's Den, The Penn State Scandal and a Rush to Judgment. Graham, welcome to Finding Freedom. Thank you for having me on the show. I've been looking forward to it. And of course, there's so much we can talk about. So I'll let you head in any direction you wish. <laughs> yes, there's there's a, a lot of directions to start, and honestly, it was it was hard for me to uh, decide where to start. Um, but I think before we, you know, start digging into 
um, the scandal and the book and everything that happened, um, I wanted to start out really just talking about Penn State and what Penn State means to you. As I talked about in your introduction, you started at Penn State. You, you had your first role there from 1973 into the early 80s. Then you came back in 1995 as the uh, university's president. So what brought you back to Penn State? Well, I, I loved my job as president of Penn State. And back when I was on the faculty, I, I had thousands of students, advisees, uh, doctoral students, undergraduates. Uh, I, I just was so attached to everything at Penn State. And when I was invited back in 1995 to become president, it, it was really a, a dream come true. I mean, who, whoever thought that that could happen. The odds are are not great, but I love Penn State. Uh, my wife got her master's and doctoral degrees here. Both of my children are Penn State graduates. Our son was born in State College, College Pennsylvania in the hospital there. So uh, our roots are very deep. Our friends were here. So it, it was it was just wonderful to be able to come back and be president. And during my time as president, I enjoyed the job a lot. I mean, make no mistake about it. It is a tough job uh, with uh, 48,000 paychecks a month and mm -hmm. 1,700 buildings on 24 campuses and nearly 100,000 students. If you count them all up, there's a crisis every day. Uh, every day, somebody does something stupid. I mean, we're, we're like a, a city. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know what? The, the challenges were great. And Every time we had a commencement, it reminded me how important this work was that we were doing in the administration and on the faculty at, at Penn State. So I love the university. And although my relationship is a little more distant now, I, I, I've i said you can take me out of Penn State, but you can't take Penn State out of me. It, it It's such a, an important part of my life and it goes way, way back. And in my inaugural State of the University address in 1995, I laid out an agenda. And I said that my top goals were humanizing the university, putting people first, uh, making Penn State the top university in the country in the integration of teaching, research, and service. And I, I, I think we were true to those goals. So it, it means a lot to me. And my name is on the diploma, uh, not only your diploma, but that of 300,000 Penn State alums. And uh, that's very meaningful to me personally. Indeed. Um, it's it's hard, hard to pivot from that into the scandal, but but I, I want to do that. And I, I kind of want to want to set this up in, in a way that so if we just fast forward, if people are actually if we rewind back to uh, November of 2011, and you know, I think mostly everyone, obviously you and I, and you especially, have a lot more knowledge uh, on this case than most people. A lot of people have really just small snippets, tunnels of of knowledge into into what happened with this case. But most people remember back in November of 2011, the the, the media firestorm that was happening, and and, and you found yourself in the middle of it. And I mean, I will be completely honest. And I said, I said the same thing to, uh, to John Ziegler when, when he was on this show. And, uh, I, I, I think it's important for people. If this is the first time that maybe you're, you're hearing me talk about, uh, this Penn state, um, scandal on, um, you know, this interview right here, I would encourage you to go back and check out those episodes with John Ziegler. I will link to them on the show notes page. And also I'll link to John Ziegler's um, podcast with the benefit of hindsight, which goes through the, the entire thing. But it's important to point out when this scandal first broke, um, as a as a as a Penn Stater at the time, I, I was I was angry. I, I was looking at it from the perspective that who uh, the prosecutors were saying were guilty um, were guilty. I, I, I was I, I was looking at it as a uh, institutional failure, and at that time that that's how you know I think most people perceived it. Um, so you're obviously on the inside of what's happening. You're, so you're gonna have a, a, obviously a much different 
much different view, um, being much closer to everything. So as everything is unfolding, November 2011, um, you've never seen a scandal like this before. What made this so different than any other crises or, or anything else you've been involved with in your, in your time with the university? Well, it, it was a terrible chapter in the life of this university and all the people who were pulled into it. Uh, and, you know, what, for our hundreds of thousands of alums and all of our students at the time uh, who loved the university, uh, a lot of people didn't know what to believe. A lot of people were upset and they were relying on what the media was telling them. And there was a, a media frenzy around this. People jumped to a lot of conclusions, but those of us who were in the middle of it and had knowledge couldn't, first of all, figure out why this was a Penn State scandal. Mm -hmm. It was a former employee, a former assistant coach who had retired years earlier, had no real connection to the university at that time, hasn't had since. He was employed by the charity he founded, the Second Mile, in 1977. So as this was unfolding and we knew there was a grand jury pursuing Jerry Sandusky, uh, our university's general counsel was saying, well, this has nothing to do with Penn State. There's nothing there. But when he was charged and two administrators at the university were charged, it, it felt like a crisis to me and to members of, of the board of trustees. And so we, we were very concerned and tried as, as hard as we could to understand what was happening. But I think because Joe Paterno was the winningest coach and the most revered coach in the history of football, and Jerry Sandusky had been uh, on the staff of Joe Paterno, all of a sudden it somehow got tied into Penn State sports and people started calling it a sports scandal, and a lot of re sports reporters and others descended on the university to cover it. It was a very painful time in the university's history, but I knew then, and certainly it's been demonstrated now, that nobody in the university administration did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew anything uh about the allegations that were being presented. Joe Paterno, Tim Curley, our athletic director, Gary Schultz, our senior vice president, and I were pulled into this. And then when the university's board of trustees brought in Louis Free to do what was supposed to be an independent investigation, one that has now since been denounced by everyone that, that has looked at it, things just continued to accelerate and and the story took on a life of its own, which was really not fair to anyone involved. So did you did you know Jerry Sandusky? Did you have any sort of you know personal relationship with him at all? I knew him just a little bit. <laughs> We'd only had one conversation ever. Uh, mm -hmm. All of my conversations about the football program were with Joe Paterno and Tim Curley. Uh, and my conversations about athletics were with other head coaches and with the athletic directors. I only had one conversation with Jerry Sandusky. It was about 25 years ago. It was after his retirement was announced and the chancellor of one of our campuses wanted to start a football program at that campus and said, we'd like Jerry Sandusky to be the coach. Would you talk to him? And I, as a courtesy, I, I spoke with him, but I had a pretty good idea we weren't going to start a second football program uh, at another Penn State campus. So, no, I didn't know Jerry Sandusky. We never socialized. I saw him from a distance a few times. After games, I would often go down to the locker room to congratulate the players as they were uh, coming into the locker room for Joe's postgame comments. Uh, so I, I went down there to show my support, and I saw Jerry Sandusky coming into the locker room along with the players and coaches among mm -hmm. 100 plus people. But no, we never interacted, never had any any relationship. So, uh, you know, the idea that somehow uh, we were involved together or that university administrators were in, in cahoots to protect him or the university's reputation, that is just totally erroneous. 
Yeah, it really doesn't make any sense once you once you dig into the case. So I, I do want to talk more about. Um, we'll stay on, stay on November twenty eleven, mm -hmm. and you know this this um, frenzy is, is happening around you. Um, prior, I'm talking about prior to the time that you resigned. Can you talk about really how how you were limited in? Um, not able to, you know, have a press conference, not able to get out in, in front of, uh, of what was going on. And really your, your feelings at the time when that, when that was happening, um, did, did you start to get in, get an idea that, man, this is, this is spiraling out of control? I certainly did. <laughs> um, when the university's, uh, legal counsel told me that there were, was going to be a, uh, a grand jury presentment, as it's called, uh, I knew that this would at least at some level become a Penn State story and we needed to, to pay attention to it. So uh, I called a, a series of meetings. First of all, I brought my uh, cabinet in and explained to them what was going on. Uh, I talked to our, our public information, news and information folks. You know, I immediately had the chairman of the board come to my office. He was practically living in my office uh, for days. Uh, his name was Steve Garbin, uh, who was the chair of the board at the time. I called uh, an emergency meeting of the board of trustees on the Saturday uh, before, as this was developing, and then again on Sunday. Um, but uh, at Penn State, we have a long history where the president is the chief executive and manages the affairs of the university is given a lot of latitude to do so. And I expected to do so, but the board of trustees, the leadership of the board of trustees decided that they wanted to manage this crisis. And in effect, they gave me a gag order. They gave Joe Paterno a gag order We're, we were probably the people in the best position to actually get out in front and talk about it, say what we knew and, and uh, bring some calm to the situation. But the board wanted to do it. And the truth is they did not manage the crisis very well. It got worse. And when they mm -hmm. fired Joe Paterno on that Sunday night in November of 2011, students took to the streets there were roving bands of students moving from the Paterno home to Old Main, uh, to downtown, an area called Beaver Canyon. And it, it got worse and worse. And the media were there, hundreds of reporters and media trucks. We had to close off a street for them. And they were actually in some ways encouraging this. The students were performing for the cameras to, to some degree. And, uh, uh, I realized that if I couldn't manage this crisis, if the board wasn't going to let me do it, then the gracious thing for me to do was to step down from the presidency uh, because you couldn't remain as president in a situation where you're not in charge and mm -hmm. doing what you always do. So I offered my resignation. They said, no, 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 at first. Uh, and then finally on that who's, Wednesday. Who, who, who's they? That's the, the chairman of the board. And the, so to be Steve, Steve Garbin and the vice chairman, John exactly. Thurman. Exactly. Uh, it was Steve Garbin who still had the title of chair of the board. But Steve was was very depressed about what was happening and unfolding. And John Serma, the vice chair, uh, was a very strong figure, a well-respected and well-regarded figure. Uh, in, in the country and on the board, he became the de facto chair and the spokesperson for the university. And uh, they, uh, they decided to fire Joe Paterno that night after asking my advice earlier in the day, what to do. And I, I said, well, if now that I'm stepping down and I, I left my office at noon that day, mm -hmm. permanently, uh, it, the, the board is the one that has to decide, but you know, there's only three games left. Uh, and, and we have a signed retirement agreement with Joe Paterno. He plans to announce his retirement. And he did in fact announce it that morning while I was meeting with the chair and the vice chair of the board, they got so angry that he announced it himself, which he, of course he was entitled to do, uh, and which our agreement expected him to do, uh, 
that they decided to fire him on the spot and they did it that evening and uh and they accepted my resignation at the same time uh it it got very messy as you know so so steve steve garbin he he played for joe paterno right so that's why he felt he needed to needed to back away yeah steve was uh the captain of the 1959 football team. He played for Mm -hmm. Joe Paterno, uh, so he was a letterman. Uh, He then went on to a very long career as the senior vice president for finance and business at Penn State. He was one of the most widely respected alumni of the university. And he told me on that Sunday before, he said, Graham, you're the only one who can manage this crisis. If the board doesn't let you do that, I'm going to have to step down as chair of the board. He said, and and in addition, I played for Joe Paterno. I hired Joe Paterno. Uh, I was involved in in the hiring of Joe as the head coach. He supervised Joe in his vice presidential role. He hired Tim Curley. He hired Gary Schultz. And he was very supportive of me. He was, in fact, one of the best board chairs that Penn State has had. And he was caught up right in, in the middle of this along with everyone else. This is, I mean, this is a speculative question, but do you think if Steve Garbin had shade, stayed on as, as chairman of the board and not not step back and allow John Surma to, uh, to take control that things would have gone differently? I can't really speculate on that. I don't know. I know that Steve didn't feel that he was in a position to do that, that that was the president's responsibility. And I think John Surma fell into the void and the members of the board, all of whom were frankly stunned by these developments, uh, allowed John Surma to have that role. And he was the one that conducted the infamous press conference where they fired Joe Paterno and and contributed to the, the firestorm. Yeah, and there's 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 lots of pieces to what's happening, right? Uh, another piece was the the governor at the time, um, Tom Corbett, right? And um, that same that same year in 2011, there had been a a large budget cut to to Penn State. Is that correct? Yeah, 2011. Yeah. Well, there, there's a history to uh, <laughs> how this unfolded, and mm-hmm. I talk in my book. Okay, here's yeah. a, a shameless plug, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say, yeah, this yeah, the, the, de- the the detail in there is, yeah, you, you go into detail in, in yeah. everything. So we yeah. don't have to talk about everything. Right, know, yeah. right. Well, here's what happened. Um, Tom Corbett had been the attorney general when they began to pursue Jerry Sandusky. Uh, he became governor, and as governor, he never said a word to me about any of this. You, you would think he was a member of our board. And he was the governor and I was the president of Penn State. I had no clue that any of this was coming. And uh, Tom Corbett, uh, I talk in the book about all of the witnesses who heard Tom Corbett say that if he was elected governor, he would get rid of Graham Spanier as president of Penn State. Hmm. And after he was elected, his first major responsibility as governor is to present a new budget. And he proposed the largest cut in the history of American higher education, which was to cut our budget by more than half. He was gonna cut our appropriation by 52.4%. And by the way, the same thing was to be true at uh, Temple University and the University of Pittsburgh. Um, So, uh, he got a, a terrible reaction to that because people love Penn State and Temple and Pitt. And uh, his popularity rankings went from in the 60 percent range, 60 some percent to 30 some percent. And I I think he he blamed me and saw me as as a bit of an enemy. And, and sure enough, the the whole Sandusky saga uh, allowed him and others who he was involved with, his prosecutors, his newly appointed uh, attorney general to indeed pursue me. And and a year after Sandusky was charged to then charge me, it it took a whole year for them to drag me into the process. The interesting thing 
is that while the so-called independent investigation by Louis Free, the former director of the FBI, was mm -hmm. going on, there was a parallel investigation by the federal government because of my having the leadership role for American higher education in national security matters and having uh, a support staff at FBI headquarters, my work with intelligence agencies, my top secret security clearances. And in fact, this has been in the news lately, I had those rare, what's called SCI clearances, sensitive compartmented information that's above top secret. Because of this evolution at Penn State, this little crisis, now we know it was a big crisis. I mean, at the time it started out small and it grew. I, by uh, as a matter of routine, had to have my security clearance redone with a new federal investigation to make sure that everyone could vouch my, for my honesty, integrity, no wrongdoing, uh, trustworthy, worthy of, of having national secrets. And that federal investigation, which was the same length of the free investigation, and the report was even longer, about 300 pages, completely exonerated me. Uh, yet... And and free free never talked to um the team that did that federal investigation is that is that correct yes it is completely correct i offered when you have a uh a top secret security clearance investigation the only people who are allowed to see it are the people in the federal government in my case, the Defense Department and other agencies, mm -hmm. the report is for them. But I'm also entitled to ask for it and see it. And if I want to share it, I am permitted to do so. Now, they redact any classified information, but there really wasn't much of that in, in my report because it was about my basic honesty and integrity. I offered that report to Louis Free. I said, before you issue your report, would you read this? I hadn't even gotten it yet, but I knew it was coming. They told me it had been ordered and it was coming. I knew that my security clearance was renewed. I said, you need to see this because it's exonerated me. Not only would he not wait for it, he has never wanted to look at it. The prosecutors, the attorneys general, Penn State's governing board members and others, mm -hmm. nobody wanted to look at it because it would go against the narrative that they were promoting. Uh, it's hard to imagine this, but even judges at various stages of the judicial process pertaining to me would not allow that federal investigation to be entered into evidence. It, it, it is amazing. And it just really goes to just the upside down incentives of this case where Penn State, because they the Penn State board, after you know this scandal, had invested so much into Louis Free and invested so much into saying that yourself and Tim Curley and Gary Schultz and Joe Paterno had had been wrong and had done um, improper things, that for them to go back on that and say actually this report says that nothing happened and we spent all this money for no reason. Um, it's they had an incentive not to do that, which is it's crazy to say that out loud. Just hearing myself say it, it sounds crazy, but that's, that's I, what happened. I did two things after the free report came out. I asked for a meeting with the board of trustees so I could mm -hmm. clarify everything, answer any questions they had. That meeting was refused. Uh, I also sent and and the letter I sent to them has become public. Uh, someone provided it to someone in the media, so that's public. Uh, I also sent confidentially, my lawyers and I sent confidentially to the university's general counsel, their new general counsel at the time, a list of errors and omissions in the free report. All of the things that were wrong with it, that is, I don't think I've ever seen the, the, the light of day, uh, that was ignored as well. And the university continued to accept the free report, to back it up, uh, to make decisions based upon it. And, and that's, that's really a shame. 
Louis Free in his investigation did not interview any of the key people with information that the federal investigators interviewed. He did not interview Gary Schultz, Tim Curley, certain members of the board of trustees, certain members of the administration. Uh, he didn't interview Mike McQuarry, Jonathan Dranoff, the doctor who talked to McQuarry after this brief report mm -hmm. and heard three times, no, I didn't see any wrongdoing. I didn't see anything sexual. No. Uh, Free, for some reason, did not interview any of the people who could have created a different narrative. And I think that's that's a terrible shame. Now, a lot of that has come out. You mentioned John Ziegler. There, uh, there's uh, uh, so many other people who have now dug into this and have provided evidence that what Free did was wrong. And I have three chapters in my book that focus on Louis Free. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, if people are interested in the real story, they need to do that. And and I, as I mentioned in the book, the university ended up paying him $8.3 million. And beyond that, they indemnified him. And what that means in legal terms is that if he was sued by anybody in any way for the report that he produced for Penn State, the university would pay his legal fees. Wow. So believe me, it goes beyond $8.3 million. Yeah, well, you, yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that. Um, you were saying other people that have come out against this narrative. Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Talking to Strangers, um, talks about this case and, and how it deserves another look. Um, so let's let's start talking about I guess we'll start with the yeah, the 2001 incident. And this is probably the incident that, that most people have at least heard something about um, the incident of Jerry Sandusky being seen in a, uh, a Penn State locker room, a, a Penn State shower with a uh, with a boy. And re really from there, um, the, the story gets it goes in a lot of different directions. I mean, if you look at the grand jury presentment, um, they put in there that the Penn State assistant who had seen it, who we found out is uh, is Mike McQuarrie, had said that he had seen sodomy, had seen anal sex. Um, McQuarrie himself came out after that and said that's not true um, in, in email exchanges that, that have been made public, saying that he never said that. Of course, McQuarrie has stayed, changed his story a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, one more thing to point out, then, then I want to obviously hear from you, but something that a lot of people don't know about this, and you talk about it in the book, of course, that this is one of the only charges that Jerry Sandusky was not convicted on. Um, so the, uh, the jury in the Jerry Sandusky case did not find um, this evidence credible. So I want, I want to hear your side of this, of course. So um, this incident occurs. What, what happens from the, the Penn State? Penn State administrative side. Well, you're, you're quite right that uh, Sandusky uh, had a number of charges that were leveled against him, but the ones pertaining to that shower incident in Penn State, uh, uh, that, that one shower, that one night, the one that Mike McQuarrie said he caught a, a two-second glance of through a mirror indirectly around a corner and never really saw any child. I think he just saw it uh, Jerry Sandusky, uh, that uh, McQuarrie has said, no, that didn't happen. He's changed his story, yes, about a lot of other things. But Jerry Sandusky was found not guilty on those charges. When I eventually read the grand jury presentment against Sandusky, I, I had a couple of thoughts. One was, there is a lot in here that has to be wrong because it doesn't match up with what I was told. It 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 just doesn't match up with what I was told. But my second thought was, if even a fraction of what is in this grand jury presentment and the indictment is true, then Jerry Sandusky should be uh, pursued to the full extent of the law. Because if any of this is so, mm -hmm. it's very egregious. And as a child abuse victim myself, I, I just could never stand for that. I, I, the, the most horrible thing that I can think of is the abuse of children. I, 
I'm an intervener and, you know, I've seen incidents in grocery stores where parents or grandparents have been abusive to children. And I just want to get in the middle of it and say, you can't be doing that. Uh, if I had the slightest hint, mm -hmm. if I knew anything about the abuse of a child, of course, I would intervene and I would report it. Something, by the way, that uh, Mike McQuarrie didn't do if he even thought something was happening. So you asked about what we learned. Uh, in, uh, in the incident, which we now think the, the really was weeks before what the prosecutors claimed it was. I think they concocted a date that wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And now there's a fair amount of evidence that it was some time before. But on a Saturday in February of 2001, Mike McQuarrie goes to see Joe Paterno and says, I want to tell you about some discomfort I had when I saw Jerry Sandusky after a workout in a shower in one of our athletic room facilities. Can, can I st uh, stop you for a minute? I just want to point out the significance of you saying that the date was much earlier. So yeah. you just said February and the evidence that, that has been collected by investigative, you know, people who've been investigating this case, that it's pr pretty solid evidence that, that a lot of people involved with this case agree with that. It was, I think, December 29th. Yes. So Mike yeah. McCreary would have waited, um, but six weeks or something like that for to, to come about, forward. About six weeks. So it's a little unclear why he went to see Joe Paterno on, on the date that he did. Mm -hmm. Joe Paterno really, from all the evidence I've seen, heard nothing from Mike McQuarrie that was very concerning, uh, other than that Mike was uncomfortable. And if he was uncomfortable, uh, then others perhaps should be as well. So he called Tim Curley. Uh, Tim Curley called Gary Schultz uh, on a Sunday. Uh, on a Monday after a routine meeting that we have with members of my cabinet, in about a 10-minute, maybe 15-minute top discussion, they said to me, we just want to give you a heads up. And this was uh, on a day when we had reports about a lot of different things. And we kind of scratched our heads figuratively about it and said, well, you know, Jerry Sandusky doesn't have a connection to the university anymore. We want to be super responsible. So let's go to the head of the second mile, tell them what's been reported to us, let them be aware of it. And we also wanted to give Jerry Sandusky a directive that people can be uncomfortable with showering with one of your youth, whether it was a second mile child or some somebody else, maybe one of his adopted children, we, we, we didn't know. Um, so Tim Curley went to meet with the head of the second mile, invited Jerry to come along if, if he wanted. Uh, Jerry said to Tim Curley, you can contact the guy who was in the shower with me that night and ask him anything you want. He will tell you that there was nothing untoward happening. We know who that is now. And, um, and so uh, Tim Curley followed up and a couple of weeks later, he caught me after another meeting and said, you know, those follow-up discussions that we talked about, I've had them and everybody's fine. And, you know, the matter's taken care of. I didn't hear another word about it for 10 years until wow. I was asked to have a meeting with members of the attorney general staff uh, to tell them if there was anything that I, I knew. I was interviewed by a prosecutor named Frank Fina, uh, by a, a deputy of his, Janelle Eschbach, uh, and by others who were, were in the room. I told them what little I knew, uh, namely that I had this recollection from a decade earlier of being uh, told about a shower and nothing else. And uh, that was that. And then over the following months, as everybody knows, things uh, unfolded. So to, to come back to the, the, the interaction um, between you and, and Tim, Tim Curley um, talking about this via email, because there was, right, there was an email that, that 
was that was it Louis Free that that said this or that said that th- this email is enough to to convict on alone or to to to, well, that, to show that's yeah. what the prosecutors were saying Bruce yeah. Beamer, who uh, we had I think six different prosecutors who right. <laughs> in sequence okay. uh, in, inherited this case uh, and yeah he was waving it around at our preliminary hearing uh, that email was actually supplied to Louis Free by Gary Schultz. The stories that they wanted to tell that how secret and discovered are completely erroneous. Gary Schultz was told by his assistant, well, we we do have an email. And Gary said, well, we need to turn that over because maybe it'll help them with with what they're looking at. Uh, That email is, of course, taken out of context, number one. Number two, uh, words in that email were selectively leaked to the media, single words, to give an impression of wrongdoing that didn't exist and didn't know the context. So the, the first leak to the media was the, the leak of the word humane that I used in that email in responding to Tim Curley. Mm-hmm. Now, Tim had said to me earlier, Graham, what if we tell Jerry Sandusky that we don't think he should be bringing anybody into the, into the showers with him after a workout? And he doesn't agree. And uh, he said, I'd like to take him with me, invite him to come to the meeting with the head of the second mile. And I'm saying to Tim Curley, well, that would be a very humane thing to do. Bring him to the meeting to talk about it. Well, they leaked that word to give the impression that I was saying it was humane to abuse children or that we should treat a child abuser humanely. That is not right. And we said later in that email that if people aren't agreeable to how we're handling this, we might have to raise it to a higher level of intervention. And I use the word vulnerable. You can be vulnerable if this continued to happen and you hadn't raised it to a higher level of invention, uh, to intervention, which I uh, talked about uh, in the email and have subsequently explained, I think, very thoroughly in in the book. That was the context. And I think we we were all pretty much on, on the same wavelength, knowing there there's no one right or wrong way to handle something like this that has never come up before, and you think you're being responsible about it, so you deal with it as well as you can. Keep in mind, we were never told the age of this person. I I only knew that the second mile was for high school age people, for teenagers. I didn't know it could be anybody younger. We weren't told the precise location. I certainly wasn't. We weren't told the time of the day. Uh, we didn't know it was in the evening, which we, we later were uh, learned years, years later. Uh, we were told it was uh, after a workout, which seems kind of normal. And it was in a shower facility, like all of them on campus at the time, and I think it's still pretty much true today, that most of our shower facilities have many different showers in one locker room. There might be 8, 12, 20 different shower heads, and oftentimes there are lots of people in there. And at that time in the university's history, we had most of the athletic facilities in central Pennsylvania. So on any given day, our gyms were full of junior high and high school students. They would come over after school and use Penn State facilities. There wasn't anything all that usual, unusual about the report. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also important to point out you're having this conversation over email on Penn State servers. If this was a conspiracy, I don't think you'll be having that conversation um, over email. So it it just doesn't it, it doesn't make any sense at all from uh, from that respect. Um, I did want to ask you. So w- with regards to this incident, did you ever have any direct contact with with Joe Paterno about it? No, Joe Paterno and I never spoke about it. Uh, when Gary Schultz and Tim Curley and I had that brief heads up meeting, uh, it was agreed that Tim Curley would be the one to follow up. So. In my administration, when any issue popped up, somebody would volunteer to be the one to follow up, and that was Tim, and he he had the lead on it. I never spoke to Joe Paterno. I never spoke to anybody for a decade 
other than Tim Curley and Gary Schultz. And in the book, I actually quote their statements submitted by their attorneys saying, no, we never told Graham Spanier anything about that because we weren't told about it. Mm -hmm. one, one of the great uh, disappointments I have, I mean, it's, I, I'd like to think of a stronger word. It, it, it's heartbreaking to me that Tim Curley and Gary Schultz, between them, served 12 months in jail and under house arrest, 12 months between them, for one nonviolent misdemeanor based on a plea bargain they took to just put this behind them because mm -hmm. of family concerns, ill health, whatever it might have been, and they, were, they did that under a promise that, okay, if, if you take this one misdemeanor, you'll be put on probation or we'll give you some community service, but you won't have to serve any time. And then they were double-crossed after they testified honestly at my trial in 2017. The prosecutors made them the last two witnesses, and they were the only witnesses who had ever spoken to me about any of this. And they said, no, we didn't tell Graham Spanier anything like that. We weren't told anything like that. And the judge and the prosecutors got so furious at them for undermining their case, what they thought was their case, that they demanded that they serve time. But the case was so weak that even while the trial, my trial was going on, mm -hmm. and even while the jury was out deliberating, they repeatedly offered me a plea bargain for the lowest level misdemeanor so they could walk away and say they won something. But it simply was not in my value system. It never will be in my value system to plead guilty to something I'm not guilty of. I told my lawyers repeatedly, I would rather serve time for a crime I did not commit than to say I committed a crime that I never did. That's honorable. Um, yeah, and that's, and, and I'm saying that without, without you know, putting any blame on Tim Curley or Gary Schultz for, for their own decision. They have their own, right. um, their own reasons for, what, for when, why they when decided they, when to they plea. took those plea bargains, each of them called me up right away and said, I just want you to know I'm doing this not because I'm guilty of anything. I don't want to, but what the attorney general is trying to do is accuse me of a whole long list of felonies. And if they could somehow persuade the jury that even one of them was true, it would be on my record and I'd have a felony and who knows what the consequences would be. So I'm just going to take this misdemeanor, and then they were double-crossed because of it. And I, I said to both of them, I, I can't do that. I, I accept that you did. Um, I understand why you did. Uh, you know, I was having medical issues at the time. Tim Curley was having medical issues. Gary Schultz had some medical issues within his family. And uh, for them to have gone to jail uh, would have been a terrible thing, and it turns out they had to anyway, which, as I say, was, was just heartbreaking to me. These are two of the most honorable people I know. They're two of the best people I've ever worked with. Neither of them deserved any of this. They didn't do anything wrong. And why did they come after people in the administration of Penn State? Why did they try to destroy Joe Paterno's reputation? Why didn't they go after the second mile? Why were they not satisfied with pursuing Jerry Sandusky, but instead had to make this into a bigger national story focused on Penn State? And of all things, it's football program. It had nothing to do with football. Yeah. So, so, so why did they? And uh, you say at one point in the book, I, I think you said this, correct me if I'm misquoting it, but um, you realized that you were you were going to be a target of uh, of the prosecution. So why do you think they were they were coming after you in particular? 
Well, first of all, Joe Paterno died within weeks mm -hmm. after he was fired. Uh, he had lung cancer, but uh, it, it had just been diagnosed. And I, I think this whole thing was so traumatic to him and his family that it accelerated his demise. So they couldn't pick on Joe anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was the big fish now. I was the president of the most visible university in Pennsylvania, the biggest, most complex university in Pennsylvania. The governor had already telegraphed his disdain for me and for Penn State. And I learned during the course of the year that while they only had one investigator looking at Jerry Sandusky for months, they had as many as a dozen, 12 or 13 wow. investigators they assigned to pursue me. They wanted to find something, anything that they could hang on me. And it took them a year to get there. And they only got there by putting, by threatening the university's general counsel, Cynthia Baldwin, with a criminal charge, offering her what's called a proffer agreement testifying at the last minute before the grand jury, where she was not truthful, three days before the election of a new attorney general, which they then used to charge me. All of those charges were eventually thrown out, and they had to concoct yet new charges to come after Tim Curley, Gary Schultz, and me. Uh, they ended up charging us with 24 crimes. And they ended up with one of the lowest level of the misdemeanors that were out there. It was a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars involving thousands of hours of time of the attorney general. It, it was so ludicrous. They even went to the trouble of sending a team to Chicago to interview relatives. And in the book, I mentioned the names of the hmm investigators and state police who showed up initially at my brother's home and were on their way to talk to my mother who was ill in a nursing home. And when she heard that they were coming to talk to her about me because they wanted to see if I was being truthful about being abused as a child, she had a heart attack. She oh never gosh. recovered from that. Uh, it, it it, it's probably melodramatic for me to say that they killed my mother, but that's how I feel about it. So you, you mentioned uh, Penn State's general counsel, Cynthia Baldwin, and you talk about in the book when the uh, grand jury was convened and they were when they were investigating Jerry Sandusky and you were called to testify. Um, I think you even said that when you were first, when you were called to testify, you didn't realize that there had been a subpoena because she didn't even tell you that there was a, a subpoena. Right. Um, so when when you were give us give us um, you know some background on this for for those listening and don't know this this part of the story, that Cynthia Baldwin, you thought right she was acting as your legal counsel when in reality she she was not right. Yes, and she should have known better. She's a former judge. Um, and an attorney, of course. And uh, the first I heard of this was when uh, when Cynthia Baldwin came to me and said, uh, they're not going to subpoena you. I've told them they're not going to subpoena the president of Penn State. I said, well, they don't have to. I would be happy to cooperate. I mean, here I have a unit at FBI headquarters that supports my work. I'm There's an officer. I'm down at FBI headquarters every month uh, working on various projects. I'm a champion of law enforcement. Uh, so there's an initial meeting with the prosecutors. And, uh, you know, what do you know about Jerry Santa? What do you know about this, that, and the other thing? And uh, I'm telling them what I know. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of that interview, Frank Fina says, do you, Dr. Spanier, do you believe in sodomy? And I'm, I'm stunned. I'm thinking, what on earth is that all about? I said, I thought in my head, is that some kind of a trick that prosecutors use to get people stirred up to see what they're going to say? Uh, 
but uh, and then I said, well, wait a minute. This is the first I've heard that that's what this investigation could be about. Well, Frank Fina then starts asking me a series of what I would describe as prurient questions. He seemed to be very interested in sex. What do I know about faculty members having sex with their students? What do I know about those kinds of things? Would it ever come to my attention if someone was trading sex for grades? And I, I'm thinking, no, I, I don't know about those things. We have a whole police department of more than 100 officers at Penn State. We get 2,000 incidents a year. The only things I'm brought into is if there's a murder or somebody dies and I might have to call the family and tell them about it. I, I said, I am the kind of university president that does not get involved in criminal or police matters. But I was very surprised by, by that line of questioning. Well, then after that meeting, Cynthia Baldwin comes back to say to me, well, you know what? They do want to talk to you after all with the grand jury. She never told me I was subpoenaed. She never showed me a subpoena. She wanted me to believe I was going voluntarily. But apparently... Why would she want you to believe that and not just tell you you were subpoenaed? Because in, in a moment of great ego on her part, she had already told me several times, this isn't a Penn State thing. Mm -hmm. And I've told them they're not going to subpoena Graham Spanier. I, and I told them they're not going to do it as if she was in charge. And because she had been a former Supreme Court justice for a period of time, of course, they would listen to her. Um, so I went and gave my grand jury testimony without being properly represented and without realizing that I might be a target. And a year, more than a year and a half later, they would be coming after me for perjury, uh, of all things, uh, when everything I told them was completely straightforward and, and honest. So at what point did you realize that well, Cynthia Baldwin was not acting as your legal counsel? Uh, on the day before I sub formally submitted my resignation and uh, the day before that Joe, Joe Paterno was fired, mm -hmm. Cynthia Baldwin came to my office and said, Graham, I can't represent you anymore. Uh, she wasn't telling me all she knew, but she seemed to have a sense of what was coming, I guess. She said, you need to get a different attorney. And on that day, I connected with a new set of attorneys and they opened my eyes. I was naive. They said, no, Graham, nobody goes before the grand jury without a subpoena. You were subpoenaed. Uh, the attorney general wouldn't turn it over to us for a year or two. We had to keep filing motions to, to get it. Uh, they, um, they told me that what Cynthia Baldwin did uh, in, uh, in lying before the grand jury uh, and, and uh, that that was inappropriate and was a, a breach not only of ethics, but the law, which is the reason why it was ultimately thrown out and why she was ultimately censured by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania for her wrongdoing in this matter, as was the lead prosecutor, Frank Fina. He had his license uh, to practice law suspended. My new lawyers, who were very smart, explained to me the lay of the land. And they said, Graham, you are perhaps a target. We have to get through the next election because the next attorney general, the next person who will likely be the attorney general, was running on a platform of straightening all of this out. She couldn't straighten it out. And Frank Fina and the others in the office turned on her. Uh, Kathleen Kane was her name. And uh, they ended up managing to sentence her to prison. Uh, and she served two and a half years of a, of a five-year prison sentence. Uh, almost everybody who was involved in this from the judicial system or from the political system has, has had quite a, a downturn. People lost their, their jobs. And, and uh, one of the chapters in the book is called Porngate and the Keystone Cops. And that's about the people who were after me, basically 
I'm taking a little license with the words here, running a pornography ring out of the attorney general office. And so who lost their jobs? Frank Fina, the head of the state college attorney general's office, the head of the state police, two Supreme Court justices, two of the seven Pennsylvania Supreme Court justices, other individuals in the judicial prosecutorial system. These pornographic emails, this is a, isn't a comment about pornography. I'm not judging anyone, but you don't do this on state owned computers out of the attorney general's office. You don't do that. And, and the, this wasn't just a little joke, a little bit of misogyny. These mm -hmm. were thousands and thousands of videos and emails and some really nasty stuff. I talk about it somewhat explicitly mm -hmm. in the book. And it, it's going to be an eye opener for people who weren't following that very closely. Yeah. And so the, the only pornography tied to this case was in the it was in the uh, the prosecutors found on their computers in this case. It wasn't found on Jerry Sandusky's computers in his house. The, one of the only um, accused, uh, you know, child predators who there's never any pornography found in, in his possession. Um, so th take of that what you will. Um, so with with regards, let's let's pause on this for a minute. With regards to Jerry Sandusky, um, you know, I, I know you don't outright come out and defend Jerry Sandusky in the book, and I, I don't expect you to. But do you think that with everything that's happened in this case, all of the uh, prosecutorial misconduct and corruption that's been exposed, uh, do you think he deserves a uh, a second trial or an, another trial? Well, I, I say early in the book that. This is not a book about Jerry Sandusky. Mm -hmm. I, as I said, I didn't know him. No one who uh, came forward as a victim has ever spoken to me. I never got a report from any of those people who received financial settlements from Penn State. I've never spoken to Jerry Sandusky about any of this. I did not attend his trial. Had I been called as a witness, I would have honestly reported what what little I knew. So, you know, I can't really comment on Jerry Sandusky, but what I do know uh, is that he was rushed to trial. You know, I served my two months in jail, two months in prison, and, and then two more months mm -hmm. in house arrest in 2021. That was 10 years after this unfolded he was rushed into trial within a matter of months and they wouldn't allow his lawyer to see the discovery material until right before discovery material is material that prosecutors are required to turn over to you to review before mm -hmm. you're accused of something uh and that didn't happen so uh there are a lot of ways in which you could look at how this unfolded for jerry sandusky and say there are some things about it that, are, that aren't right, but I'm not in a position to pro proclaim guilt or innocence for anybody except me, because I know about my innocence. I know about Tim Curley and Gary Schultz's and Joe Paterno's innocence. Uh, but uh, I know there are a lot of advocates for Jerry Sandusky out there who would like to have a new look at this. Right. So, so you spoke about Tim Curley and uh, and Gary Schultz and you know how much you, you value their their character and their you know the, the way that they've handled themselves throughout their their careers. I'm curious to get your your opinions on, on Joe Paterno and, and and his character because there is a, there is a chapter in, in the book about about the Paternos. Yes, yeah. Well, I say in the book that. I don't think there was a, a head football coach and a university president who had a better relationship than Joe Paterno and I did. And I think I can say that for a number of reasons. First of all, Joe was very respectful of the fact that I was the president of Penn State, uh, that he would come to my office for meetings, that when it came to matters of NCAA legislation, or something that uh, that impacted 
the conduct of football nationally uh, or the, the bowl championship series, which I oversaw, or my role as chairman of the board of the NCAA, Joe deferred to me. He might have an opinion about it. And I always asked his opinion, but he said, you're the president. You have the vote for Penn State. And as the years went on, he would increasingly say, Graham, you know more about these matters than I do. So I'm going to support what, whatever you do. Joe and I had a ritual. I, I talk about this a little bit in the book where uh, I, when I had VIPs uh, who I was hosting uh, for football games, they, mm -hmm. you know, would come to my pregame event. They would sit with me in, in my suite at the stadium. I would take them onto the field before the game, never during the game. I would never want to interfere, but I would take them onto the field before the game, which was a real privilege. It, it's quite something, if you can imagine it, if your viewers can imagine being in a football stadium before kickoff where 110,000 enthusiastic, loyal, loving Penn State fans are, mm -hmm. are cheering. Joe would always interrupt the warm-ups, come over to meet with me and greet my guests. He could talk to anybody. He could talk to a high school recruit as well as someone with a PhD, as well as a U.S. Supreme Court justice or a Hollywood star. He, he was so good at that, and he would pose for pictures with them. I had a photographer there. I would send those people pictures on Monday morning, uh, someone on the university relations staff would develop them over the weekend and bring them to me. And I would send them to those folks. We raised millions of dollars because of that one gesture of respect that Joe Paterno shared to me. And my gestures of respect for him, of course, were to uh, talk about him positively whenever I could to uh, be involved, to go to his home for, dinners when invited, when he and Sue would have dinners after football games, win or lose. Um, Joe and I, believe it or not, never talked about football. I, I just don't recall a football conversation. Hmm. You know, I would get emails from alums. And if it was a down year, we had a few, uh, and get thousands of emails yeah. and letter, nasty letters from some alumni. You've got to tell Joe to pass more play so-and-so at this position, and I never did that. Um, but uh, we never talked about football. What Joe wanted to talk about was academics, was fundraising at Penn State, how to advance the university. That is a remarkable thing for a head football coach. We never talked about his salary. He was one of the lowest paid of the major coaches in collegiate football, because it wasn't about the money to him. And, you know, he didn't have a contract. Uh, we, for That's most, amazing. For most of his years, he didn't have a contract. Now everybody's got a contract, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there was nothing in his contract about if I play in a national championship game or win the Big Ten mm -hmm. or go to a bowl game, I get a bonus. But Tim Curley and I and Gary Schultz, we would say, well, we want to give him a bonus. And he would say, well, just give it to my assistant coaches. And we'd say, well, we are going to give your assistant coaches a bonus, but we're also going to give you a bonus. And he would say, okay, if you insist on doing that, go ahead. But I'm signing the check right over to the libraries. He never took a dollar of bonus. He sent it to the university libraries. That is the kind of character and integrity that Joe Paterno had. And that's the kind of person Sue Paterno had. Penn State was her life. I, I talk about Sue as the first lady of Penn State, mm -hmm. a wonderful friend. And to this day, she is among my very closest personal friends. We do things together. We talk on the phone often. We support each other. Even 10 years later, we're both still getting over this. We've cried together on many occasions. We've sat around her kitchen table to talk of, about how incredible and how terrible this whole thing is. And, and not just for us, because there were dozens, I'm not exaggerating, dozens of other people at Penn State who lost their jobs, 
were reassigned. I mean, you'd expect when there's a coaching change that some of the assistant coaches are going to need to take other positions or, or retire. But it went beyond assistant coaches. It was athletic department staff. It was the housekeeper at the president's residence. It was the acting athletic director. I mean, you go down the line and you look at all of these people and their families. It's a terrible thing that happened. And frankly, it wasn't fair. And it, it hasn't entirely been fixed yet. Yeah, well, th thank you for sharing that. And uh, 100%, there's there's a lot that, that needs to be fixed still. And hopefully it, it can in, a, in, in some way. Um, but before I let you go, Graham, and I mean, there's there's more we could talk about, but I want to encourage people to go out there and get the book because you will get everything in the book. If you could maybe share with people, um, it's not out yet, is it right? It's not officially well, released. When is when's the yeah, release date? It, it's called In the Lion's Den. Let me get it in front of the camera there. The Penn State Scandal and a Rush to Judgment. I, I wish we didn't have to call it the Penn State Scandal because I don't really think there was a scandal at Penn State, but it was made in, into a Penn State scandal. It can be pre-ordered on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. It is in their hands now, and we are just waiting any day now for them to send it to all of the people who have pre-ordered the book. Meanwhile, I have speaking engagements and book signings, appearances lined up around the country through the fall. I'm, I'm just about at the limit now, probably, of what I can handle. I'll be putting thousands of miles on, on my car, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm eager to get out there because just like in our discussion here, people have questions and there is so much that people don't know. And if they read the book ahead of time, that's great. If they don't, you know, maybe they'll buy it after they hear me speak about it a little bit. But yeah, it's on pre-order now. If, if you go to any of those sites and you just put in a Spanier, the book will come out. The other thing that I'll mention is we have a website for the book. Uh, I have someone, uh, Mary Beth Schmidt, who mm -hmm. uh, oversaw Penn Staters for Responsible Stewardship, thousands of people who have just been so supportive of me along the way. I, I'm so grateful to them. I, I, I love them all. And Mary Beth has been handling these appearances, and, and she has a website and a Facebook site. But the website is simply called Spanier in the Lion's Den. Spanier in the lion's den.com. And we have in there discussions of the book. You can listen to the, um, to the prologue of the book. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to actually post your interview with me on that website. If you send us a copy electronically, we will promote that and, and, and put the link up there as well. People can listen to those things and they can see as they're confirmed the various places that will be appearing uh, about half of them around Pennsylvania and the others in various places around the country. Well, if you come to the Pittsburgh area, I'll uh, maybe come out and say hi if you're. Uh, we if you're we will be coming to the Pittsburgh area. I think we just confirmed one in Monroeville, which is okay. near you. And we're talking about another one that's a, a little north of there. And there may be another one as well. So, yeah, we will be in your general area. We'll be all awesome. over Pennsylvania. I'll keep my eyes open. And Graham, thank you again so much for being generous with, with your time and for uh, being so open, um, sharing about all of this. And uh, I will also make sure to put all the links that Graham mentioned on the show notes page for this interview so, so people can, can find it easily and get the book. So Graham, thank you for coming on the show. Really you, appreciate it. You are welcome and good luck to you with this ongoing great video cast that you have. <laughs> thank you, sir. You bet. Incredible to uh, to see what's happened. It's devastating to see what's happened. As Graham talked about, the a number of lives who have been really turned upside down and quite frankly ruined by this case. Um, of course, outside of the obvious ones, uh, people who worked around Penn State, who who worked in some of these roles, who lost their jobs, and you know it's especially when you've been at a, a university working in one of these roles for many, many years, decades in many cases, and, you're, and you have your, the, the rug pulled out from under you when you did nothing wrong. Um, I can only imagine what a, uh, what a devastating feeling that is. So I will say again, like I said at the top of the show, if you don't know everything about this case like I do 
and like um, you know, a lot of people who are passionate about um, seeking justice here, I would encourage you to go to the show notes page for this episode at lionsofliberty.com and listen to some of the old episodes and or go to John Ziegler's podcast with the benefit of hindsight and dig into that. It's like 20 episodes and it'll, it, it'll blow your mind. So that's all I have on the interview interview for today. I did want to make a request that if you do enjoy this content, please consider supporting uh, the Lions of Liberty in this show. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty, or you can go to lionsofliberty.locals.com. One of these days, I will remember the URL for being a Locals patron. But at either of those two places, a great way to support the Lions of Liberty and the work that we're doing. So you can give as little as $5 to partake in a lot of the bonus content that we have and participate in, in live streams and ask questions. You could have seen that interview with Graham Spanier when I recorded it earlier this week instead of waiting until Thursday. So a lot of perks in the pride, and I will leave it at that. It's been an absolute pre- absolute pleasure to bring this information to you today. And uh, I hope if this is your first time listening to Finding Freedom on Lions of Liberty, that you'll come back and find us again. You can either find it wherever you're listening now, which might be the Lions of Liberty network feed, or it might be my Finding Freedom solo feed. And of course, you can find that Finding Freedom solo feed if you're looking for it by just searching Finding Freedom and my name, John Odermatt. It'll pop up. You can subscribe and leave a nice five-star rating and a review. I would appreciate it more than you know. So please go ahead and do that. And I'll see y'all next week. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires literally burn.